What have you heard? What do you see? Asked St. John. I saw nothing, but I heard a voice somewhere cry, Jane, Jane, Jane. These bleak Yorkshire moors are immortalised in the novels of three 19th century sisters. The genius of the Brontes, Charlotte, Emily and Anne, was so daring and so remarkable that it revolutionised what was believed possible for women to write. In the literary landscape, they became legends. My name is Aoife Hines. I'm an actor. And like so many fans of the Brontes, I've been thrilled by their tales of brooding anti-heroes and lonely governesses, and at how this dramatic, windswept landscape seeped so deeply into their imaginations. But this isn't the whole picture. I'm going to dig a little deeper into another chapter of their story, which is every bit as inspiring as anything written by the sisters. Perched on the edge of the moors lies the village of Haworth. In the 19th century, this was a bustling industrial town lying on the main route from Yorkshire to Lancashire. Life here was harsh and often short, with a life expectancy of just 24. Illness and death were a constant presence for those who lived here. This is the old Haworth parsonage where the Bronte's father, Patrick, an Anglican clergyman, was appointed rector. So this is the house where the sisters were brought up and where their literary vocation was born. I'm longing to see the personal belongings of this extraordinary family. I'll be searching for clues to a less well-known part of the Bronte story, an Irish tale of love and loss, deeply rooted in Ulster. Patrick and his wife Mariah had six children, two of whom died young from tuberculosis. And from early childhood, the parsonage was the home of the remaining four children, Charlotte, Emily, Anne, and their brother Branwell. Everything on the table virtually belonged to the family. Um, the writing desk belonged to Anne Bronte, um, and the, the china, the needlework boxes, and it's interesting that while their father had his own study, um, the sisters had to kind of make do with corners of the dining room table. And sharing the space. Yeah. So the first time I was introduced to Jane Eyre, I was about six, and my dad was playing Mr Rochester in a TV adaptation. And I remember being kind of scarred by the scene where Mr Rochester is in bed and the bed is engulfed in flames. And apparently it's believed that Charlotte's inspiration for that bit was an incident that happened here in the parsonage where Branwell had come back in a drunken state and left a candle alight and the bed caught on fire. And it was Emily who saved him. A broken love affair and descent into addiction ruined Branwell's hopes of becoming an artist. While the sisters were heartbroken about their brother, they continued to perfect their craft. You can just imagine them pacing around this table, talking about what they were working on. And their novels were rooted in the people and landscape of North Yorkshire. But a question raised in the preface of an early edition of Jane Eyre points us to somewhere else. Has it ever been sufficiently recognised that Charlotte Bronte is first and foremost an Irish woman? This question is a clue to another part of their story, rooted in Ireland. Two men born in Ulster, their father Patrick from Rathfair Island and Charlotte's husband, Arthur Bell Nichols from Killeed County Antrim. And they had a lasting impact on the Brontes, their work and their legacy. Patrick was appointed to the prestigious post of Vicar of Haworth in June 1819. It was a world away from his humble childhood in County Down. 
We've got some very early images of Patrick Bronte's birthplace in Emdale. So these are sort of dating from the late 19th century. But you can see what a you know, kind of basic um, little funny. building it is wow. um, in contrast with the parsonage. Yeah, Patrick Bronte's birthplace, County Down. And very early on, you get um, that part of Ireland being known as the Bronte District. Already, wow. I have come to Rathfor Island in County Down to see where Patrick Bronte was brought up. The landscape feels different here. Rolling drumlins and pasture, quite unlike the desolate moors of Yorkshire. So Patrick Bronte was born here in this cottage on St. Patrick's Day, 1777. He wrote about it in a poem in his book, Cottage Poems. Some called it the Cabin of Morn, a neat Irish cabin, snow-proof, well-thatched, had a good earthen floor, one chimney in midst of the roof, one window and one latched door. Escaped from the pitiless storm, I entered the humble retreat. Compact was the building and warm, its furniture simple and neat. Seeing this tumble-down cottage makes me curious as to how Patrick went from this to the relative luxury of the parsonage in Haworth. What was Patrick Bronte's early life like in Ireland? His father was a tenant farmer. He rented uh, land uh, in the Rough Ireland area and um, gradually built up quite a substantial land holding substantially enough to be able to support a family of 10 children. Patrick himself went to school very early, developed a great love of books. Um, but the big factor in his life that changed everything for him really was the fact that his ambition and his talent for literature, for learning for the classics, was noticed by the Reverend Thomas Ty, who was the vicar rector of Drumballyroney Church. Hello. Well, welcome to the Thank parish you. church of the Brontes. Thank you. So here we are, Aoife, inside the body of the parish church that was built in 1780. It was a replacement building uh, and it was built under the directions of Thomas Tye, who was the rector. And what are these paintings on the walls? Well, these, these paintings depict scenes from uh, the life of the Brontes and they were painted by an artist called Rita Duffy some 40 years ago. And they very graphically display some of the events and happenings of uh, Hugh and Alice's life, Patrick's parents. Legends have sprung up about the origins of the Bronte name. There were many variations, including Bronte or Pronte or even Branty. Whatever they were called, Hugh and Alice ensured their family were educated. He was a chap who had been born in the roughest of cottages and no academic background whatsoever. And yet, yet there was that little spark in him. Patrick tells us himself that he decided he was going to be a schoolmaster and he set up his own school at the age of 16. And Patrick came here as the school teacher in 1798, so some 220 years ago. Uh, he was appointed schoolmaster and stayed here for about four years. Patrick was fiercely intelligent and determined to fulfill his potential, a quality which he would pass on and encourage in his daughters. Patrick Bronte believed in education as a way of bettering himself, but he also felt a calling to serve God when Reverend Thomas Ty opened up the opportunity for him to follow in his footsteps, he took it. He clearly saw that Patrick had not just the ability but the faith and the ambition to do good and to be somebody. Mm. But if he was going to be a clergyman, he needed to go to university. It was the only way to get in. Right. And there was only either Dublin, Trinity College Dublin, or Oxford or Cambridge. 
and Thomas Ty himself had been to St John's College, Cambridge. And St John's was unique in that it had special scholarships that were intended for poor boys who couldn't pay their own way. Patrick comes here to Cambridge, what it must have been like to arrive from rural Ireland to the grandeur of St John's College. And through a combination of hard work and natural intelligence, he flourishes. It must have just been the most overwhelming experience because to come from that sort of fairly simple, lowly background and then to see Cambridge with all those towers rising up and all the weight of history. And Patrick must have felt that weight of history. Mm. And people there recognised in him straight away that he was something unusual. And it wasn't just the Irish accent, but that made a big difference, obviously, when he went in to sign up and the, the registrars couldn't tell what his name was because of the strength of his Irish accent. So I've been given access to the admissions register here at St John's College of 1802. And you can see here that Patrick entered the college as Patrick Branty, and it's very clearly written Branty, B-R-A-N-T-Y. In the space of what we can imagine is a few months, there is this other evidence, which is a register of one of his tutors, where we see that there has been a change from Patrick Bronte to Patrick Bronte, B-R-O-N-T-E. I mean, there is some debate around the reasons why he changed from Bronte to Bronte, but what we know for sure is that this is the name that he would take on thereafter and pass on to his daughters that would then make the name famous. Most of the students there were wealthy young men from landowning families or members of the gentry. But Patrick got there by sheer grit and ambition and working really, really hard. And for the four years that he was at Cambridge, he was in the first class throughout his entire academic career. These were Patrick Bronte's prize books. Um, from his days at St John's College, Cambridge. And if you look here, he's actually inscribed the book, the My Prize Book, for having always kept in the first class at St John's College, Cambridge, to be retained semper, P. Bronte, A. B. So these were, you know, very prized within the family. This farm labourer's son had travelled a long way from his humble beginnings in County Down. I imagine he would have been very proud that the works of his three daughters, Charlotte, Emily and Anne, would be studied and read here for generations and generations. I am Heathcliff. He's always, always in my mind. Not as a pleasure, any more than I am always a pleasure to myself, but as my own being. So don't talk of our separation again. After graduating from Cambridge, like his great mentor Ty, he took orders to become curate and serves as a minister in rural England for the next decade. Eventually, Patrick settles here in Haworth, where he was appointed as the perpetual curate at St Michael's and All Angels Church. One of the key things to understanding Patrick and his role in his children's life is the fact that he was a passionate educator. He was passionate about spreading education in the village, and he was passionate about educating his daughters in a way that was really unusual at the time. But he encouraged them to use their imaginations and to explore and to be involved. And that's all the things that really made the Brontes what they were in later life. The Bronte children grew up in a home filled with literature and learning. Their father, Patrick, was in fact the first Bronte to write and publish poems and a novel. So the Brontes grew up with seeing his name on the spines of books mm. in the library, in the little tiny library that they had at the parsonage. And one of those books, one of the ones that I think is probably the most influential on the young Brontes, is one that Patrick wrote about called The Maid of Killarney. 
What a beautiful lake, exclaims Albion, while he accompanies his friend on the banks of Killarney. Can England or Scotland produce anything like this? Behold how the broad sun dips in that watery mirror. So you can see that Patrick's influence and the Irish influence coming back, because the book is all about Ireland, um, is actually creating the future uh, authors of the Bronte novels. Inspired by their father, Charlotte was determined that she and her sisters publish too, being wary of publicity and wanting their work to be judged on its literary merit rather than their sex. They chose deliberately ambiguous pseudonyms. They would publish under the names Curra, Ellis, and Acton Bell. Wow, the author Jane Eyre, an autobiography by Curra Bell, in three volumes. She literally woke up and found herself famous. It was a huge, huge success. And suddenly everybody wanted to know who Carabelle could be. And of course that was followed by um, Wuthering Heights by Ellis Bell and Agnes Grey by Acton Bell. And there was this um, huge interest in whether it was three people or one person. Yes. And then how long after Jane Eyre came out was it actually revealed that it was Charlotte it was, it. it was actually 1850 before anybody knew for definite um, and Charlotte actually wrote a biographical notice which appeared um, in an early edition of Wuthering Heights and that made it clear that they were three sisters. Um, there'd been rumours that had kind of leaked out um, mm. but at the point when Emily died in 1848 nobody knew that she was the author of Wuthering Heights. Amidst their newfound fame, I wondered, was their Irishness something to keep quiet about? After all, it was an era in which the Irish were discriminated against in England. Stereotypes were rife, depicting the Irish as lazy, dirty and alcoholic. And we know that around that time there was a lot of anti-Irish sentiment. Was that something that Patrick and his children would have experienced in Haworth? It's really interesting that you get these odd glimpses um, in completely different sources of people identifying the Brontes as Irish. Mm. Um, Mary Taylor, who was a school friend of Charlotte Bronte, says that when Charlotte went to school at Roe Head, she had an Irish accent. When Bramwell got involved in the local election, they called, called him the old Irish and his landlord wrote him down as Irish. So the, the, there is that continuing theme of Irishness, um, which people outside clearly perceived. Um, but I don't think that they did. But there was this odd idea, you know, that it was something that you sort of shrugged off quickly when you were rising up the social ladder. Right. And there were an awful lot of Irish clergy in England at the time, and of course, Charlotte's husband. <laughs> yes, so the other <laughs> Irishman in, in Charlotte's life. And a key figure too, yeah. yeah. Charlotte's husband was another Osterman, Arthur Bell Nichols, who came from Khalid in County Antrim. Like Patrick, he too came from a poor farming family and was adopted by an academic mentor, his uncle, Dr. Alan Bell, who also saw education as the way to better yourself. So Dr. Bell encouraged Arthur to have a proper academic education, to go into the church. Mm. So he went to Trinity College in Dublin and then over to England and became a curate and came up to Haworth to be the curate of Haworth and was there for seven long years. He would have met the Bronte family almost on a daily basis. And as a result of that, he would have witnessed all the things that happened. The next two years brought untold tragedy to the Bronte family. Tuberculosis raged in Haworth at the time, and Branwell, struggling with addiction, neglected his own health and left himself open to infection. He died aged to just 31. But the greater tragedy was that he brought the disease home. Emily and Anne fell ill, and they too succumbed to that terrible sickness aged just 30 and 29. And then when that 
shocking year, 1848 to nine, when Charlotte loses all her siblings, one after the other, you know, Bramwell first, then Emily, and then Anne in within nine months of each other. And Arthur Bell Nichols is still there and is st in the background. He was very empathetic towards her and he started to, uh, it became more than empathy after a while. It, blossomed into something stronger. And then eventually when Charlotte realises that she's so lonely, he proposes marriage to her. And it's one of the, the great romances, actually, of the Bronte story. This is actually um, the veil um, that Charlotte wore with her wedding bonnet. Um, it's amazing it's been conserved so well. It's in quite good condition. Yeah. Um, so Charlotte was described on her wedding day as looking like a little snowdrop. Um, she wore a bonnet that was decorated with green leaves um, and, and this veil. After the wedding, Charlotte and Arthur decided to honeymoon in Ireland. They visited Dublin, Banagher and the West Coast. She wrote six letters to friends expressing her love for her new husband and his birthplace. It's amazing seeing that, you know, her handwriting. I think it always says a lot about a writer. They've written you know, vigorously, avidly. It just all needs to come out. Yeah, and, and I think letters are about so much more than just what the word say you can really tell from you know how hard the pen is being pressed how hard far someone is writing mm. um exactly and this is pe is this written in pencil no it's actually an in ink but it's okay. quite faded um and they're all written on these lovely folded sheets on very very fine delicate paper that we try to touch as little as possible mm. um and you can see there are lots of crossings out yeah. and when she sort of decides to rephrase something. After such family tragedy, these letters home reveal a Charlotte who is finally experiencing some happiness and looking forward to a future with Arthur. This is an extract from a letter Charlotte wrote to a friend, Miss Wooler, during her honeymoon in Ireland. I must say, I like my new relations. My dear husband, too, appears in a new light here in his own country. More than once, I have had deep pleasure in hearing his praises on all sides. Some of the old servants and followers of family tell me I am a most fortunate person for that I have got one of the best gentlemen in the country. And she signed it C.B. Nichols, Charlotte Bronte Nichols. After the honeymoon, Charlotte and her new husband returned to the parsonage in Yorkshire, where Arthur resumed his duties as curate. They were only married for nine months, which is so sad. And, you know, Charlotte says in her last letters she couldn't have asked for a, for a tenderer nurse. And those letters, written in pencil, where she's reassuring her friends, you know, that, that how wonderful her husband is. Mm. It's really touching. Sadly, Charlotte and Arthur's love was short-lived. She died in Haworth of what is believed to be severe morning sickness, only nine months after they got married. And she's buried here, under the floor at Haworth Parish Church. Arthur lived on in Haworth for another six years, taking care of Patrick until his death in 1861, aged 84. He had outlived his wife Mariah and all of his six children. Arthur should have become the, the rector of Haworth. He really should have been chosen to be it. Uh, but bloody-minded Yorkshiremen decided they weren't going to have him. So he had to pack up everything. And he kept all the tiny fragments of writing, all those little books that, that Charlotte and Bramwell had written, he kept them. He kept all the, the, the bits of paper that had just jottings on, the drawings, and a phenomenal amount of stuff that's all very personal, very intimate. 
And he did it because he loved her and he loved the family too. And he took it all back with him to Ireland. Having lost Charlotte, Patrick and his job, Arthur decided to return to Ireland. So what is the significance of this house here in Banagher? This is Hill House. This is the house that Arthur Bell Nichols lived after he came back from Haworth. He came to live with his aunt, Mrs. Bell, and his cousin, Mary Annabelle. He was so devastated when Charlotte died, you think he'd never remarry. But having said that, I think he was a practical man as well, and he saw the benefits of um, a close relationship with his cousin, uh, Mary Annabelle. And she was somebody who very much took a back seat in the thing because she understood that he was still very much affiliated to Charlotte. And she celebrated Charlotte's birthday in this house every year. She also celebrated the anniversary of her death and they were just a month apart. So she allowed the house to be decorated with all the various objects in the house, the portrait, the long case clock and the stairs. Um, she allowed it to be colonised really with the Brontiana and she accepted all that. They didn't have any children, but then they live on in Ireland, uh, in Banagher, until 1906. And by that stage, the Brontes are worldwide famous and everybody wants to get their hands on that collection. When he died on the 2nd of December 1906, just a few weeks before his 88th birthday, Mary had his coffin placed under Charlotte's portrait until it was carried from Hill House. He was buried here, in the churchyard at Banagher. He left her everything and there was no obligation in those days. And it was quite a bit, it was 4,200 and 25 pounds, which was a lot of money in 1906. But the strange thing is, the one thing he didn't leave her, and it was probably a very valuable thing, and that was the Richmond portrait of Charlotte. Arthur left it to the National Portrait Gallery. Many of the remaining items were purchased by the Bronte Society and returned to Haworth. What is the significance of these two men from Ulster having such an important role in Charlotte's life? I think both of them played a critical role. I think Patrick's influence is paramount um, because it literally shapes his children, the way he educates them, the way he encourages them. So he imbued them with that, that need and that, that love of learning absolutely shapes them as people, but shapes them as writers too. And if it hadn't been for Arthur Bell Nichols preserving it all, we wouldn't have a, a tenth of the stuff that we now have. And that it is such an insight into the Brontes, not just their writings, but their lives too. So he's a crucial figure in this whole Bronte story. Exploring this overlooked chapter of the Bronte sisters' story has been a revelation. Their ties to Ireland and the inspiration of their father. Little did I know when I first watched Jane Eyre how close I would feel to them now. <laughs>